Hey, what's up you guys? I have a very special treat for you tonight. I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Zach Bush. Um, I'm, he's gonna pop on here in just a second, but while I'm waiting for him, um, here, let me go ahead and type up what we're doing. Dr. Zach Bush, uh, here he is. He's on here, welcome, welcome. All right, let me get our comment pin and bring Dr. Zach on. What's up, Andrea? Good to see you, girl. All right, let's see. Yay! Hi, Dr. Zach. How, so are, how you? are you? Oh, good. It's such a treat. I've been looking forward to this so much. Thank you so uh, much for taking time to do this tonight. I really appreciate I'm thrilled to be with you and your audience. Your yeah. Power yeah i i'm like i i told everybody i'm like just gonna say just talk and the whole time and don't stop <laughs> <laughs> i'm not gonna say anything i just want my audience to hear what you have to say your message needs to be heard and first i'm just gonna say thank you thank you for what you're doing because i've i've been watching all your live videos in preparation for this and i'm like man he is out there just teaching and teaching and teaching i know that's a labor of love so Thank you for what you're doing. Um, a little background for anybody who doesn't know who Dr. Zach is. Um, you're a doctor and you were in emergency medicine, were you not? For a while? I have internal medicine, which is hospital based medicine. So, I spent you know, many years just admitting patients out of the emergency room into the hospital system. So, a lot of ICU care and that kind of thing. And then went on to endocrinology and metabolism, which is hormone medicine. And in that uh, work, got into cancer research and was doing chemotherapy development and then left that uh, university setting in 2010, started a nutrition center for reversing chronic disease with, with food. And in that journey, made some incredible discoveries uh, that, that nature graced upon us and our science team around how the microbiome uh, informs us and, and really empowers healing within the body. So uh, yeah. I've come to, to try to make myself obsolete as a doctor and let nature do the work. Yeah, and that's exactly where I wanted to start with this. So the topic of our conversation is our physiological and spiritual need for nature. And I love I was watching a presentation of yours. And I think you said on your on your team, you have like a something like a director of esoteric science. Is that how you put yeah. it? Oh, you're talking you're talking to all these medical doctors. And you're like, you should really have one of these on your team. I'm like, yeah. yes, <laughs> way to lead. That's so awesome. So I wanted to get I wanted to start right off with that um, on nature. Like why? What happened? Like, where did this start? Where did you get this connection to nature? And what, because I see you out there, because I feel similar, like nature gives me my answers and I just do <laughs> everything I'm yeah. doing to mimic nature, right? So where, where did this start for you? Um, you know, in hindsight, I think it probably started as a kiddo. Um, a lot of seeds were planted, uh, metaphorically, perhaps there by my mother. And uh, I was born to two hippies in Boulder. And and I had a wonderful childhood, just uh, always outside. I grew up in low-income housing in Boulder, which is was just a great experience because the, the population was so diverse. Uh, I go back to Boulder now, and it's like white bread capital of the planet with a bunch of 20-something old, overpaid, you know, computer programmers. But yeah. um, back in the day, you know, growing up there, it was certainly the hippie movement was strong in the late 60s and 70s there. And then uh, you know, it was interesting because uh, there was a huge world war really going on that was so hidden from America at the time. But the, the devastation that we had caused in Asia had led to a huge refugee status. And so I grew up with a lot of Hmong people uh, from uh, from so so South Asia that were refugeed from a lot of the war torn uh, environment down there. And so I grew up in, among uh, an interesting group there. And that was my first time in the gardens was in the community gardens outside of the uh the, the low-income housing there and the Hmong women would sit around all day uh squatting in their traditional garb and they would plant with a uh, sharp sharpened stick just one seed at a time and take care of their gardens uh, squatting across you know patches of, of garden to one another talking all day and so i witnessed you know i think in that childhood experience i had these big memories of just like you know women talking nurturing the earth growing food being connected and uh, my mom learned how to garden in that environment. Uh, her mom gardened a bit too, so she grew up a bit with that in Pennsylvania. But it was really, I think, there where she really got her passion. And uh, my mother to this day is an extraordinary gardener and, and just a passionate outdoors woman too. She's an adventurer and uh, has taken me and, and all my siblings on some of the most ridiculous hikes in history where we were all complaining the whole time and exhausted. But she always wanted to get us to the top of the mountain. And I think she's got a lot to do with the kind of the drive that's in me and everything else. And then from a professional standpoint, you know, it's been an interesting journey. I think 
or I started in the right spot. I, I went to the Philippines uh, with an opportunity. I, I was going into engineering and then uh, decided to take a year off and um, went over to the Philippines, worked with a group of midwives, uh, international uh, midwives, birthing babies. And uh, that changed my life. When, I, when you see the miracle of life and babies emerging and out of just such poverty and stricken, you know, yeah, malnutrition and everything else. And yet life is so resilient. These, these babies, yeah, there was one that died. Uh, the first baby I ever delivered actually died you know, uh, weeks later, I think, but mm. uh, was born premature to a woman who was uh, severely disabled neurologically. She had you know, some sort of cerebral palsy or something, but she showed up on our doorstep of my aunt's house in the middle of the night bleeding out. And um, she couldn't talk due to her neurologic condition. She was, you know, uh, really mentally disabled. And mm-hmm. so she was bleeding out and I was in the back of the van and we were trying to drive her to a hospital. And she birthed this baby in the back of this van as we were going across Manila. And this little thing fit in my palm, like the whole baby was in the palm of my hand. It was a premature little malnourished infant and born blue. And, you know, I was, I was so overwhelmed emotionally and everything else by the whole experience. The one was bleeding and afraid she was going to die. And, uh, and I was, had no medical experience, I had no place being a part of any of that. And, you know, I was thrust into this experience and, uh, the baby started crying after a few minutes and started to you know, take its first breath. And, uh, to that, to this day, that kind of roots me in this experience of just how resilient life is. We are here on purpose. And that purpose may be to take a few breaths and scream into the world the extreme injustice of a woman born into poverty, a woman with no education, with no cognitive capacity for engagement in society, raped in the squats of the Philippines to become pregnant and then have no idea she's actually pregnant. She's you know, had no idea that there was a baby there or why, why she was bleeding. Um and then this child came in on purpose and changed my life in a few screams and, and to show me as a 19 year old kid that life is resilient, life is on purpose and, and for every brief moment that it's here, it will change the world. And so for me, that little scream keeps going in my life of, of there is injustice in the world and there are solutions for that injustice. And we are, are the solution as a community, we are the solution. And so um, that's where it started. And then I think it got drummed out of me pretty thoroughly in Western medicine as I decided to go into medicine. Uh, I spent 17 years in academic medicine. And you know, once you're on faculty and everything else, you, you forget you know, your roots. You forget the magic. You, it turns into drudgery. It turns into you know, kind of a scrambling, backstabbing environment of the politics of academia. And you're trying to get grant funding from the NIH. And you know, it's just like this sense of scarcity and isolation and over responsibility. And meanwhile, you feel like you're the finger in the dike of chronic disease that's coming into the ER every night and ICUs just full of people that you just discharged a couple months ago with the same condition and nothing, nobody was outside the hospital to help get them in a different place. And so they're right back in the same situation. You're watching taxpayers spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day on ICU care that doesn't have any hope of really, you know, changing the course of this person and this life as they dial down. Uh, and so I think I lost my hope for quite a while and I was pretty depressed by 2010 and then really had a major spiritual shift happen in that year. And um, that set me on the path to leave academic medicine, which I was terrified by. I was really frightened uh, to a deep degree to start my own clinic to be fully responsible seven days a week, you know, 365 days a year for patients with no partners, no, uh, it was intense. And, and so that journey was terrifying and I found incredible partnership in my patients themselves. They became my medical partners. They became my teachers. They became my mentors. Mm -hmm. And I was in a tiny town of 550 people in rural Virginia, uh, real dense poverty in that area of the world food desert and everything else. And I was trying to teach a plant-based diet to reverse chronic disease. And these patients became incredible partners. Just African-American pastor that comes to mind who came in with diabetes, heart disease, all the typical stuff. And when he found out that his solution was the same for the solution for the rest of his community, which was grow your own food. um, He ended up growing like a four acre garden uh, that was feeding 40 families in the community by the end of it. And just a beautiful journey of seeing the desire for people at the grassroots of life to 
to make radical change in their lives and to provide radically for their community and to, to provide radical service. And uh, I think that got that found me back to my, my my roots of the Philippines and everything else is wow. I needed to step off that that you know hallowed halls and marbled halls of, of University of Virginia and its Ivy League kind of feel to it. And I need to get out of there and practice medicine, real medicine, real medicine I think is listening. And I, I listen for for longer than I ever had to patients. And I mm-hmm. when I first started, I was spending like three hours for an initial visit. I had no patients, so I might as well just keep talking to the patient. <laughs> and and in that process, you know, I just, you know, had an extremely ex- deep experience of of uh, vulnerability with those patients and they taught me so much. So I think that was my 360 journey from, you know, origin story to, to you know, led, in, led astray for a while there uh, back in it. And uh, now, you know, I can't believe my life. Like, you know, the miracles that have unfolded over the last 10 years to bring me, you mentioned that esoteric science, uh, my director of esoteric science is William Vitalis, and he and I met on a canoe trip uh, that we took our sons on for our birthday party uh, with a mutual friend and um, met around the campfire, basically, and started talking about, you know, human biology and his weird, he's a music major in the past, but has been working in, in weird esoteric healing centers around the world for 25 years. He was blowing my mind every five minutes and, you know, we were just having so much fun talking about the potential of mixing uh, these worlds of alternative medicine or traditional 4,000 year old medicine with uh, this conventional pharmaceutical minded you know, world. And what would a hybrid of that look like? And um, in the end, I, I had to set down almost all my tools that I was using. I brought very little to the table. It's, it's my acupuncturist who's uh, from from China, she's amazing practitioner of Chinese medicine, Chinese herbalism, and acupuncture, and she's practicing knowledge that goes back four thousand years. I was practicing knowledge that goes back four years or ten years. And, you know, modern science is not mature; it is so infantile. Right. And so it was so humbling to find out that you know, on that extreme of ancient Chinese wisdom, I was missing all of that after seventeen years of academic medicine, triple board certified, all the BS. Right. And then here's William Vitalis, who's a music major, showing me the future, which is vibrational medicine and the vibration of sound and the vibration of you know, energy fields and how that's going to be the future of medicine. So I got caught up in the collision of the ancient and, and the future uh, to find out that, that my, my education gave me no tools to use, but it gave me a framework of knowledge. And that's what I bring to the scenario, I think, is uh, I have a scientific rigor in of my mind that allows me to start to look at these you know, ancient technologies and future technologies and start to put some framework around them. How do we even develop a lexicon to develop the understanding of where human potential lies? Because I don't think we've ever seen it. We haven't scratched the potential yet. Right, right. You know, like we talk about kind of the primal paleo, like nature is my guide. I'm trying to make mimic nature, but I'm like, yeah, but back then, like everyone was nutrient, nutrient deprived too, because we didn't quite have all the systems in place. And now I feel like we have more potential for than ever to be the healthiest that human beings have ever been. And your story, I have to, I have to say like, that's so inspiring that you were able to just lay down all of this. I mean, you had invested so much, so many years, so much money, so much, um, like you probably had a bit of your identity wrapped into it. I'm this triple board certified doctor, you know, and like, this was this safe place. It was like, yep, I can stay right here. Cause this is safe. And you let it all go. And that is such a scary, scary thing for people to do. So bravo. And like, you're showing you're living just by being you, you're showing this is what can happen if you follow divinity, that divine call, that pool that you're feeling that you need to let go of all these things and go that way. You know, if, um, mm. I'll, I'll just add real quick. A friend of mine is reading the surrender experiment right now by Michael Singer. I don't know if you've read it, but he had this vision and a dream that he was floating down a river and there were all these people on the side of the river and they were clinging to the side of the river because it was safe but on the side of the river there were rocks and branches and thorny things and it wasn't a fun place to be and he was in pure bliss as he floated down the flow of life and that's what I hear you went it's scary to just get on your back and float down the river like here I am Totally. Yeah, that's you did that's, it. His, that's his book surrender experiment. I think so good. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's amazing, you know, and you know, I think he has such an interesting trajectory to his career. You know, he goes from you know kind of pastoring a, a tight knit intentional community in the Midwest mm-hmm. to CEO and founder of multi billion you know or billion dollar company and and or hundred million and whatever it was um, with uh, his 
his midline uh, kind of online uh, company that he launched and, and sold it ultimately, and then and then watched it get all torn torn away with lawsuits and all this BS, and and he never changed pace. He was still the the pastoral care for this community at the end of a twenty year journey of of that, and he he seems to have never cared the least, and he never stayed. He never developed, as you said, never took on as an identity at any point the trajectory. And his identity has remained sound through that. And what a lesson there of like, if if that's what we teach our children, we will win the game as parents. Uh, yeah. Surrender the journey, celebrate the journey. Yeah. Don't anchor your identity in the journey. Yeah. Uh, be willing for transformation. <laughs> yes. And that's what you're doing. Like you're living your purpose. And it's so clear. It's so contagious. Just to listen to you is honestly so inspiring because because you were willing to go through that scary moment and let go of all those attachments. Say, you know what? I guess I'm working in rural Virginia, listening to somebody talk for three hours because my heart is saying this is the way to go. Like bravo, bravo. Like that is so amazing. <laughs> um, we've got a comment here. Desert Moon Goddess is saying you choose the path of least resistance. And absolutely. And you know what? The divinity has taught me that and they've it's also taught me recently there is no resistance there's no resistance the resistance is in us you know and as soon as we let go of that resistance i feel like we can be aligned with what the universe has for us because it's like it's an abundant universe saying here you go like i want you to have all the happiness in the world you know yeah Um, all right let's move on into oh go ahead yeah what's your thoughts I, i think you know for me when i look back to that transition from academia to rural virginia I was terrified to make that move. And so I created, uh, you know, massive, you know, pain and suffering for myself over a six month period because I was given the vision of what I needed to do mm. um, and then walked away from it, you know, talked to, to, to my loved ones at the time. And, and it was kind of like, oh, that sounds like a pipe dream scoffing, but you, you've right. got two kids. They're going to be in college soon. You need to make some money. You need to don't leave the comfort of, of your crappy job that was paying me $75,000 a year with $200,000 of school debt. Like I was getting paid less than a manager at McDonald's oh. to be an academic position at, at UVA. Wow. And so, but nonetheless, that would look like security, you know, to me. And, and they promised this great career ahead and blah, blah, blah. Right. And so I was so afraid to let go of that. And so in your point that, you know, the, the passive leaf resistance is the easiest to go, or we choose the, I was choosing against it. And so I had been shown the vision. This is what you should go do. And I walked away from it. And two weeks later, you know, the door started slamming in my face every two weeks from there on out. And and finally, by April, my fun, the funding for the university had collapsed. We were suddenly in the midst of this massive recession, you know, that was impacting every, all the universities. And suddenly the university was imploding. And I literally had to take the only path out, which was the vision that had come. And so if I had just done the thing and said, oh, that's what I'm doing next and then worked to that for six months, but instead I resisted that for six months until my stubborn brain had so been beat to a pulp and I, I was being ground down into the pavement because I was trying to go the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I did make the jump, uh, there was certainly no resistance out there because there was nobody else out in rural Virginia to, to give me any friction. So I was suddenly like in this you know wide open canvas to paint the future on and it's been all the right people have come. Ultimately, my success is not in my own journey. It's in in bridge building with community and bridge building to like-minded, high vibration people who really want to see a different future. And William uh, was uh, remains one of my closest friends, very involved in the companies that we run. And uh, it's just a brilliant mind and always questioning the, the status quo, always questioning the reality we're told we're living in because I think it's too easy to be duped. It's too easy to slip into the convenience of believing that the reality is what it looks do you mind sharing how you got that vision do you meditate or like is it just something that came in or what happened there that first one was just kind of brutal um you know uh it it, 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 there was nothing nuanced that i was doing i was really depressed you know at that time and you know i went through this short period of my life where i was clinically depressed during that and Mm. uh, uh, very lonely you get really lonely when you're a new faculty person and maybe uh, I think it actually goes all the way through faculty. Really. It's very hard to have real friends in academic medicine because of the political nature that's created there and the lack of trust that's there. And it's, it's pretty brutal. And, and so it's pretty lonely. I didn't, I, I was looking at a you know, 30, 40 year career and felt like a cog in a machine and, and very hard to, to find your path. Um, so I was pretty low and, and I hadn't, 
you know, just in prayer, just kind of cried out to the universe of just like, show me a different way. Like this is, I am, I can't do this anymore. And, it's, and the sentence I used, I've since revised because it was a foolish sentence to use, which was made me a living sacrifice for mankind. Just, I want to just do good and, and I don't need anything. And, um, but in that vulnerability of saying, look, you slaughter me if you need to, but make me make this worth it for humanity. Um, and I think I have more light in my life now. And I think I, I, I've been able to realize that, uh, my cry to the universe is, is now let me play with humanity. Let me play with a, a humanity that hasn't been born yet. Let me be a part of a future, uh, you know, people, let me be part of something bigger than myself and play and let me have fun and, and let me enjoy my wife and kids and let me have more kids. Let me, you know, just proliferate life and joy in this world. But when I, that's, you know, a, a big change from where I was 10 years ago. And, uh, but for whatever reason, you know, within, you know, a couple of weeks of making that vulnerable cry out for a change, uh, the vision, this vision came of wow. all these companies and how they were going to integrate to help wow. give, give, give a parallel pathway to academic kind of Western medicine and, the whole medical system at large, as well as the energy sector. I mean, it was very grandiose view and, and my staff has to hear about it all the time now, because we're actually, you know, all of that's come to be. I thought it was like the rest of my life that I've been shown, but in 10 years, it's all kind of come coming into fruition very quickly. So at any rate, I, I think wow. uh, in the end, we have to surrender the vision too, because the vision can become your story. And, and if you let the vision become your story, then you're stuck on the, the journey of getting the download or whatever it is. And you have a silly download story. They're like, no, the vision is just the vision part. Now you got to go do all of that. And to do all of that, you've got to actually let go of the vision because the vision is too big and, and overwhelming. You don't have the expertise to pull that off. You don't know what the hell you're doing when you start a company and let alone start some you know mega thing that you were given a vision for. If you hold to the vision, you'll be overwhelmed by it and try it down, which happened to me multiple times in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but now I think, you know, the, the execution is is really a joy where every day I wake up without a to-do list because um, I'm always frustrated by how little I get done in a day if I start to consider the things I would like to get done. And so instead, wake up and say, okay, this is the very first thing that I'm tackling. And then I'm, this is the next thing I'm tackling and right now. I'm with you and to be present with you and not be sucked into the other 32 things that I've been doing or about to do in the day. Uh, it, it takes a huge amount of surrender, second to second, moment to moment to be present. Yeah. Amen, man. This is such a message for hope. And I feel like it's such perfect timing with the Corona thing because so many people have experienced shifts lately. And I've, I've lived, I've lived similar to what you're talking about. It's this feeling of like all these doors are closing and there's this big, huge open door at the end of the hall with like sunshine and rainbows and unicorns. But if you go through that one, you might fall. Cause like, you never been, but you, you know, these other ugly little brown doors you've been in a million times. You're like, I'll just keep going through those. And the universe is like, no, just freaking jump. And you're like, ah, Oh, it's awesome here. I like it here, you know? And I think like so many of us are going to that. We're just latched on to this, this safety of this place that sucks, you know? And so sometimes I think we're so bogged down into that. We're so locked into it. The universe is like, okay, we're gonna have to intervene big time here. Like they are locked yeah. in, like, here you go. Like go this way, you know, jump. It's okay. Um, and that's what I'm hearing. I feel like this is such a message of hope because people can watch and see the fulfillment. Like you radiate the fulfillment, you radiate that. And it's come through. Yes. Like I feel that from you. I just had a very meaningful conversation with a client and I know exactly what you're talking about. I was just like, how can I help you better? You know, like what, what do you need more? And it's just this very loving, like, um, I was like, thank you for telling me how you feel. You know, it's a very loving, wonderful place to be. And that is so much hope because we're all so focused on, you know, it will be better when life will be better when, but it's, how about now? This is amazing. All, all of us here right now are being uplifted. By the way, just stalk Zach stuff because you will, Dr. Zach stuff, because you will just be uplifted every time you listen to it. So thank you. Thank you. But I want to get into a little bit, a little bit of the science stuff, if that's okay, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I, I've heard you talking a little bit about gut health and Corona and the immune system. And obviously guys, like, if you don't know, this is, um, Dr. Zach's product. So I'd love for you to talk about this a little bit. This is Ion Biome. It used to be Restore, correct? 
We're yeah. still now ion biome. Okay. So um, anyway, this is for gut health. So obviously um, Dr. Zach specializes in gut health. So could you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts with the Corona thing and the immune system and the gut and where, how you see this whole, whole thing from a science standpoint? Yeah. Um, there's a piece that just came out on high wire today as an hour and 15 minute, uh, interview, uh, on this subject that I did, uh, with Dale Big Tree. And so, uh, you can get a deeper dive there. And then I've got a, I'm filming a three hour piece that I've been working on for the last eight weeks on, on the big, big picture of viruses and how we've so misunderstood them and so miscategorized them actually as microbiome. Uh, I don't believe the viruses are at all a part of the microbiome. The microbiome is is a, a living ecosystem of bacteria, fungi, parasites uh, that thrive in every niche and cranny of nature. I mean, the microbiome, bacteria, fungi, and parasites are literally in every breath of air, uh, seawater, soil systems, freshwater systems. You, your gut, yes, but your eyes, your skin, your nasal sinuses your your ears they're actually in your internal organs there's actually a whole biome of your in a healthy breast that gets stressed out when a tumor happens and then the microbiome tries to kill the tumor and it's always trying to help you then there's a microbiome in your brain of all things like now we know that there's you know this rich ecosystem uh taking care of your brain from moment to moment in, in your life your prostate your kidneys your ovaries the uterus itself microbiome everywhere and so the microbiome, again, are living creatures, bacteria, fungi, and, and like viruses are not even creatures. They're not even living anything. They can't reproduce. They can't make, you know, proteins. They can't make fuel or energy. Uh, they, they're, they're literally just floating genetic material that's been exuded by other life forms that are trying to communicate with their environment. And so viruses are, are a genetic code or a genetic language by which we communicate uh, with uh, in other species. And this is very important because we now know that interspecies relationship, especially between bacteria and human cells, is the way that human cells know who they are. You actually lose cellular identity. You lose self-identity as a human at the cellular level if you don't have microbiome present. And this is what we see happening when, you know, repeated antibiotics or even when you shift the immune system's relationship through over-vaccination and things like this, you can see autoimmune disease just start skyrocketing. Autoimmune disease is the process in which the immune system gets confused as to what's outside and what's inside, what is self and what is not. And so the immune system starts to attack your own body in that utter confusion. Cancer is then the end state of that confusion of total isolation of a cell. When that's lost all contact with your body, it thinks it's the only semblance of life left, and yet it's so damaged that it can't repair itself, so its only option is reproduce. And so it starts to divide and we call that a tumor, but really a tumor is just a single cell that thinks it's the last semblance of life because it's so detached from the greater organism. And we now know that the microbiome predicts that, that detachment. So you miss these bacteria, you get breast cancer, you lose these bacteria, you get colon cancer, et cetera. So we now know that the microbiome is the communication network, you know, that keeps the cells in contact and in, in a regenerative repair state. And so this, you know, apparent p pandemic that's happening is an extension of a stressed out biology of the planet. And we are the stressor. We are the catastrophic injury to the planet. Our behavior, our collective consumptive, destructive behavior as humankind has been going on for 200,000 years. But the acceleration in the last 30 years, especially on, on the uh, affliction that we've been on the microbiome through uh, our agricultural system, we're pouring four and a half billion pounds of Roundup into the soils and water systems of the planet every year now. And that antibiotic is steeping into our rivers, into our rain. 75% of our rainfall is contaminated around up 75% of the air we breathe. And so we are living in an antibiotic you know, nightmare. And the microbiome, as it falters, leaves us lonely. And in our loneliness, we start to mis misfunction. And that leads to mood disorder and neurologic injury and vulnerability in our children and adults which we've seen with this explosion of autism, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorders, explosion of neurologic degenerative diseases like MS, ALS, uh, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all going like this starting in the mid-1990s when we started spraying our food directly with an antibiotic roundup. And so and that's been the journey into understanding that the microbiome, both at, the, at that microscopic level and the macrobiome with you know, the livestock being a good example of a very stressed out you know, a uh, system of, you know, pigs, poultry, 
as a humanitarian nightmare. It's like, you know, Holocaust times 10 going on in these feed facilities. You can't even breathe the air. It's so toxic. And that's the food that we put on our plate. And so we have bred this nightmare of a situation, uh, uh, and the result is stress signaling in the genome. We call those viruses, but viruses are simply adaptation signals from a stressed out microbiology. Uh, at least 50% of them are made by bacteria through something called bacteriophage, which are the viruses that, that uh, come from bacteria. And then the viruses uh, that are not bacteriophage are coming from mammals and other you know, multicellular organisms. Um, an earthworm can put them out. And uh, now humans, we produce our own whole genetic you know, communication network, just like the rest of the, the world does. And so we put that out as large RNA and DNA strands like a virus and those form what we call exosomes. We can put out big RNA DNA that can actually go and bind to you. And I, I can then literally... If you want to think of it in an infection, I can, just like a virus, insert my genome into your genome uh, by just proximity and, and space and time. And so we stress each other out at the genetic level, and we send stress adaptation to one another through that genetic code. We also send microRNA, which are tiny little uh, genetic sequences that don't go on to code a protein. So they don't really fit into the virus category because they can't code a protein, but they are still genetic information that, that then decides how the genes that do make proteins behave. And I, I exude microRNA in my saliva, in my stool, in my urine. Like I'm exuding these little tiny pockets of genetic information out into the space and time and change the environment by my attitude. And I've learned this in spades in my clinic, that if I have a woman who's in my clinic obese and overweight and fighting with diabetes, and she seems to be doing all the things right, uh, I'm trained in medicine. If if they say they're doing everything right, but their blood work is getting worse and they're getting more diabetic and gaining more weight, they're just not doing what they say. They must be lying. Well, after years of you know coming to know my patients, I, I had to come to terms with the fact that these patients were often eating healthier than I was, and they were gaining weight, and all the wrong things were happening. And in that journey, I started asking about that bigger environment. Of, well, what else is going on in your home? And it turns out they have three other household members who are stressed out, obese, diabetic, and refusing to change their lifestyle. So here's this woman trying to do all the right things, but she's inundated with microRNA and genomic information from her family that's literally just like a virus coding her genome for the stress pattern that she's living. And so if you're frustrated with your physical and mental state, despite all of your efforts, ask the simple question of, who am I surrounding myself with? And do I need to have a serious talk with my spouse or my housemates or my children? Like, I'm on this journey towards health and I need you to be on, on board with this so that I can move forward because your behavior is coding my behavior. I am stuck because you're stuck, because you're unwilling to make the changes that I, I feel necessary in my life. I'm going to have to distance myself and maybe you change the change the, the daily routine in the house so there's more space for you to have your own genomic sequence, for you to have your own genomic experience. If that's the case, then you need to surround yourself by the right people that are doing the right thing more often in the day. Uh, surround yourself with that experience. And, and I, I, I guarantee you, you will have a different one. Your experience will shift at the emotional level, physical level, genomic level. Shift will happen. So now we say there's this virus attacking the world. A virus has never attacked the world. The virus isn't a living being. It has no intention. It's a message of adaptation and stress from Asia. Well, what started that? Did a military you know, compound create that? No, nature created the coronavirus. It's been around forever. SARS looked just like corona now. You know, SARS was 2002, 2012. MERS out of the Middle East looks the same thing. So these coronaviruses keep happening because we are stressing the environment more and more. There's adaptation within that coronavirus. And we've seen a big adaptation with this one this time. There's a totally new RNA strand for a new protein that we haven't seen in a form of coronavirus that we've looked at. Is it really new? Probably not. There's 10 to the 31 viruses in the air. There's 10 to the 31 viruses in the soil. There's 10 to the 31 viruses in the ocean water. This, that means there's 10 million times more viruses in the ocean than our stars in the entire universe. 10 to the 31 is a massive number. We can't comprehend that complexity of genomic information out there that we call virus. It's a sea of virus, literally, that we are surrounded by. And so we can't think that these things are against us. If, if the genome was against us, we would have never, never developed. And incredibly, now that we're able to decode the human genome, 
We now know that 50% of our genes have already been mapped back to viral source. They got inserted by a virus. That's, a, that's our human genome. 10% is from re retroviruses like HIV and coronavirus. And so if we had not had the experience of coming in cats, we wouldn't be able to function as a species. We wouldn't exist as a species if not for retroviruses and, and the DNA viruses out there that built who we are today. And so we are the result of nature. We are not the enemy of nature. And we keep posturing as the latter. Wow, that was powerful. Um, all right, people are watching this and we're getting questions like probiotics, fermented foods. What do I do? Okay, I'm in. <laughs> like, what do I do? So I think, you know, what are, what are the most important actions that you see need to happen for this to shift? Whether that's on, yes, a bigger level that maybe some of us are capable of doing on our own all the way down to small daily actions that we can all do. What are the big pieces first, right? Like putting the big balls in the jar first, then we can fill in the sand. Like, what are the, what are the balls? What are the big pieces that Perfect. you feel like need yeah. to have, have to happen for things to shift. Yeah. So probiotics are interesting. Probiotics are, uh, you know, I think we're important in the sense that for the first time in, in 120 years, we started to believe that maybe there was such a thing as good bacteria. Up until the probiotic history, we just had the feeling that we were just, you know, out to treat with antibiotics, everything we could. So I think probiotic history had an important piece of the, the journey that we're on to understanding gut health and micro, the microbiome as a whole but they are a disaster when it comes to actual gut health. Uh, probiotics are very narrow uh, uh, species, right? So you you flip your bottle around your probiotic, you're gonna have three species, right. maybe seven species in your bottle. There's a couple on the market that maybe boast 24. There's one or two that boast they have 100 species. I don't care if it's three species or 100 species, you're trying to now take billions of copies a day of three species where there should be 30,000 species and there should be 5 million species of fungi. And there should be, you know, 300,000 species of parasite that are deciding on how to interact with you on a daily basis. And what you've done is exactly what we did in the agricultural world, which is plant three species over everything. Wipe out 97% of the grasslands and, and jungles of the world and plant corn, soybean, and wheat. So three species devastated the, the biodiversity and the ecology of the planet to lead us down the path towards climate change, global warming, and, and the collapse of, of biology on the planet. And meanwhile, we did the exact same thing in our gut for 30 years now. People have been taking probiotics to their own detriment, ultimately. And you know, if you'd asked me two years ago, I would say all of that. And if you just got an antibiotic, maybe you should take it then. And then 2018 happened, and two incredible studies got done, published in the journal Cell, which is one of our most revered, peer-reviewed science journals. The first one in mice, the second one in humans, showing that after two weeks of antibiotics, if you take a probiotic, you freeze the, the recovery uh, right where the, the antibiotic had you suppressed to. So you lose 80% of your biodiversity. When, you, when you, the antibiotic stops, your gut starts to recover. But if you start a probiotic, it suppresses right back down to where the, the antibiotic had, had suppressed you. Wow. And uh, the human study actually went for six months. And in the probiotic arm, at six months, they still hadn't recovered back to baseline. If they took placebo, which a third of them did, they were back to normal gut flora in regard to their pre-antibiotic levels within 30 days. Wow. And so we, we now have a $47 billion probiotic industry that needs to be replaced by nothing. And I'm intrigued <laughs> by that. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So I know people are curious and it's like, oh, let's get it from the horse's mouth. What is this? <laughs> what is I on yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's the opposite of a probiotic. Um, so this is a sterile product, no bacteria, fungi, anything else. Um, this came out of that experience in my clinic in 2012. We were going through soil science, trying to figure out why our patients were on a plant-based diet. We're getting more inflammation. We're trying to make, you know, figure out why the food had failed us. And um, a third of my patients were, were getting worse, not better on things like kale and Brussels sprouts and all the healthiest, you know, alkaloid containing medicinal foods I could put into them. They were getting worse. And so in that journey, we were in the soil uh, science and found a molecule that looked similar to the chemotherapy I used to make with the realization that these compounds in soil could carry information. And so I, my research in cancer was around redox signaling, mitochondria, blah, blah, blah. But um, the realization that that soil could have a medicinal messenger-like uh, characteristic was super exciting to me, especially because it had this big carbon backbone, which would keep it stable outside of human cells. And so the redox chemistry I had studied was very ethereal, only lasts for a millionth of a second at a time inside the human cell, very, it needs to be very protected. Whereas this big carbon chain on the backbone of this redox potential meant that it could maybe survive the transit of a gut or soil systems and all of that. And so 
that's what we started working on. So we started extracting and, and uh, creating the uh, production system of this in 2013. Um, and so we, we pull uh, the communication network, all these tiny little carbon molecules, which come in different flavors. So every species of bacteria and fungi makes a different shape of the molecule. And uh, so we take this vast, you know, millions and millions of versions of these carbon molecules, put them through uh, a, a redox signaling process that gets hydrogen to bind back on the oxygen so that it's not an oxidative compound. So it doesn't do damage to the gut, kidney, tubules, et cetera. And so then we, we get it into that neutral state and then we put it into uh, a liquid supplement and you can take that uh, by mouth. And so what you're showing there, I on Gut Health was our debut in 2014 on, on the national stage at Expo East. We won the next award. And then, um, you know, since then, I've kind of gone crazy, busy all over the world. We, we shipped to 120 countries. Um, we really cut our teeth with concerned mothers of autistic children and the like who have very messed up guts. And so we kind of started there and have done the whole gamut with uh, special interest groups or trying to find, you know, non-medicinal, uh, non-pharmaceutical approaches to stabilizing the gut. And so the communication network that we have there uh, has done many extraordinary things because what it's really doing is empowering your natural intrinsic healing capacity at the cellular level you don't need anything to repair you just need to know what needs to be repaired and so this thing that functions as that wireless communication network between the cells the cell tower has never started a cell phone conversation with your grandma but without that cell phone tower you, your grandma doesn't can't get to you to tell you what her problem is and so in the same way the human cells once isolated from the microbiome once you damage the microbiome lose the cell phone signal and now all the cells are, are not talking and you start to start to accumulate damage and, and failure to repair and you start an accelerated aging process. Ion Biome gives back that soil nurture state, the communication network, all the cell phone towers go on, cells are communicating and they just go into their own repair state. And one of the most profound studies that we've done is to demonstrate that uh, when you put this on a gut lining that's been damaged by Roundup, it repairs itself within minutes. And so the excitement is mother nature in soil 60 million years ago, planted an antidote to the toxin that we would kill her soils with today. And there's something poetic about that. Definitely. You know, I have to share, like, I, I can't say for sure, but my mom got coronavirus. My mom's in a nursing home. She had a severe stroke in January. She's type two diabetic. She was very weak. She's lost her memory. She doesn't remember living. I'm from Virginia, by the way. So, um, yay. but she doesn't remember living in Virginia for most of her life, you know, and it's just, she's not in a good way. And then she got coronavirus. And I, the light of me finding this out was someone from her church called me and said, my uncle who's in the nursing home with your mom died of coronavirus this morning. Have you checked on your mom? And I'm like, I have, but I haven't gotten word on her testing. I call and they're like, yep, she has it. So I'm like, great. So uh, my friend, Aaron, who actually um, works on your team, like hurried and shipped her some ion biome super fast. And I shipped her a bunch of other immune boosters, but um, she was not doing well for a while. Right. And I was like, please, when it's so hard sometimes in the nursing homes to like, get them to do the things that you want them yeah. to do that aren't, I have to keep calling and nagging and like, did you get it? Are you giving it to her? You know? Um, yeah. so finally it, it got kind of bad. Like on a Saturday, the nurse told me, um, Hey, listen, I'm just being real with you right now. Like your mom is falling into the pattern that we see the patients fall into before they pass. Like her oxygen keeps dropping. She hasn't eaten in four days. She's very weak. Um, she's like, I'm not saying she can't recover. I'm just being real with you. Like I I'm concerned and I wouldn't bring it up to you if I wasn't concerned. And so it wasn't looking good. And, um, and then she started to make a turnaround on Sunday. And by Monday, everything, almost all of her symptoms were gone. And I was talking on Monday night to the nurse and I, and I was like, have you been giving her the supplements that I sent out, you know? And she's like, I've just been giving her that mineral oil. And I was like, what mineral oil? And she's like that ion stuff. I was like, oh, you have, oh good. And I couldn't help but wonder. I like, I texted Aaron. I'm like, I think you just saved my mom's life. So that was all they had given her at that point was the, was the ion biome. And I just, I don't know. I mean, I can't say for sure, but I'm very grateful because I know she needed that healing. I know she needed that nature in her. So thank you for creating mm -hmm. the products because for me, I don't know. I just, I watched like total downhill to all better after she started taking this up. I can't say for sure, but in my heart, I feel like that is what helped her pull out of well, that. There's a lot of science to support that. So in 2009 was the first big study that showed, you know, really potent antiviral effect of microbial, you know, uh, communication. So 
um, in 2009, we knew it, you know, combated influenza, HIV, lots, lots of different things could be combated by the microbiome. And this makes sense because bacteria, fungi, and, uh, and parasites have to stay in balance, right? Mm -hmm. And so they use the viral communication network to create that balance. If you have a loss of that balance, you're going to get an overly strong signal. In this case, we killed the microbiome of, of central China through you know, dumping a ton of Roundup there. It's the most heavily sprayed Roundup in, in China is in Hubei province, right, where the virus comes from. And so, uh, you know, you kill the microbiome, you develop a stress signal at the genetic level for all of that. And then you come sweeping back in, give a huge signal to the microbiome to come alive. We see huge, you know, increase in stool volume. We see all those, you know, bacterial fungal uh, kind of network come into a balanced state. Now it's producing a huge amount of genetic information. And so it's not that the virus was attacking your mom. Your mom was, was vulnerable to the, the inflammatory signaling of the virus that was trying to clean up her body. The virus is always trying to induce an inflammatory, you know, kind of shift in the body for an adaptation, but she didn't have the reserve. So there was no way. So she's falling further and further behind as the virus is trying to push, you know, metabolism, immune system, fevers to, to clear the body mm -hmm. uh, off, and she can't keep up. And then you suddenly get back communication network. Boom, microbiome expands. Boom. boom. Genetic, you know, comes out. The genome starts expressing itself. Corona becomes a very small signal within the milieu of millions, or if not billions, of other signals now at the genetic level coming together and health stabilizes. And so the product didn't heal your mom. Your mom's microbiome's response to communication is what, what was the pathway that works over and over again. That 2009 study is a great clinical study showing that effect. And we just did a, two, two, we did a double blind placebo control trial last year uh, looking at immune system response to this. And it's very cool because the microbiome, as soon as it starts seeing the communication network, starts making lysine, which is the the main compound that you that the immune system uses to balance the microbiome and so the product is inspiring the body to, to build a resilience that would keep a balanced relationship to the microbiome and then send enough signal at the genetic level so that there's not just one overwhelming signal of you know corona stress instead it's no there's no stress the biome's coming back up you know all this non-stress signal balances that out and now the body doesn't have to have that inflammatory you know, reactivity to it. So that's in kind of picture mode there. Not, 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 the science is a lot more in depth than that. I'm actually doing a three hour film on all the science behind that right now. But cool. and, and uh, the hour and 15 minutes on high wire this morning, actually, um, that's a 75 minute overview of, of what I just said there. But nice. um, anyway, uh, I think that wow. you can start to get a sense of your, your mother's journey is the journey of the planet right now, which is if we leave you in isolation, which is of course what we're told to do because there was a virus, you should isolate. That's the opposite of what you need to do. You need to get connected. And so if you connect at the molecular level and I believe at the social spiritual level, your resilience comes back online. Um, and, and if we leave one another in isolation, uh, we are likely to, to die sooner. And that's not actually necessarily that dark either in the sense that we want to get to the other side. We forget that, but our souls are yearning to be on the other side too. Like this is a fun run, but at some point you want to be back in the, in the, the origin energy. You want to be back on the other side of the veil. And, and so I think I've seen a lot of patients that were on hospice or otherwise who've taken this opportunity of COVID to make the jump and, and, and really get out there. And so I, I'm intrigued by the beauty of that too. I really believe we pick our time and, you know, there's a long history in native American culture and other indigenous people where they take their last walk. They decide they wake up in the morning, like this is my last day. And they walk out into the wilderness and sit down by a tree and give up their spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's how they were taught to do it. And we, we, we lost that sense of sovereignty. We lost that sense of, of reverence for life and rebirth at the end of life. And we see it as some sort of end point or some sort of dead end. Your mother is, is preparing. She's getting ready mm -hmm. for a relaunch. And mm -hmm. uh, my mother-in-law has got Alzheimer's right now. And it's heartbreaking on one level. But yeah. she's very much here still. Like she hasn't let go, which means she's working still on this side of the veil mm -hmm. to prepare something. She's working in ways non-cognitive, non-verbal. She's spiritually working mm -hmm. to still be in the body, to hold space here on the planet, to do something. And, and it's too mysterious of a journey for us to judge that journey or say it's a, a, a tragedy or 
it feels like a tragedy because we have heartbreak mm-hmm. for the loss of a loved one. Mm-hmm. But our feeling isn't the reality. Uh, our feeling is, is, is through through the glass darkly, as Scripture says, and all that. And so we we need to really release uh, our elders to take the journey they need to take. And, and while disease is rampant, and I think way beyond what it needs to be right now, it doesn't mean it's not our path. This is our path as humanity. Mm-hmm. Apparently, we needed 52% of our children with a chronic disease, as we have today. Apparently, we needed 50% of adults with cancer. Because uh, that's our journey, and that's what we needed. And we don't change, we don't transform, we don't move spirituality, we don't move consciousness until we're in crisis, until we're hitting the wall. Mm-hmm. And then we make the cry out of make me a living sacrifice, or make me a light being, or make me something beautiful, sure. uh, because this is not my state. And so yep. we're there as a species now, and COVID is calling us to it. When it goes normal again, in the next couple of weeks, we were, you can all get out, do your thing. Let's make sure we don't go back to normal. Our previous Mm -hmm. moment is killing the planet. We need to transform. So do not go back to normal. Go back to amazing. Go back to beauty. Go back to nature. Go back to a different priority list in your day. Mm, I love that. And that's, thank you for saying that. Cause that's, you know, when I found out, when I was delivered the news of your mom has coronavirus and she's already in a really bad way and she does have dementia, she can hardly remember anything. And I, you know, I cried, I was like, I'm going to lose my mom. And I've had a lot of personal goals in my business to like help her financially. And it's really driven me. And I want to take her to Hawaii and experience that. And I was like, Oh, I'm too late. I'm too late. You know, and I was heartbroken and I was crying and I was like, I was talking to, you know, divinity. And I was just like, the thought just came in like, what, wait a minute. Don't you honor your divine path? Like you're going to try to block hers. (laughs) like if this is her divine path like that's her path that's beautiful like don't block it you know so um i love i love that um yeah uh wu-tang paul stamets has a stack for alzheimer's yeah thank you i'm a huge paul stamets fan i got to meet him not too long ago wonderful wonderful man on fungus i love the fungus (laughs) um uh last question do you mind getting a little woo-woo with me a little spiritual okay let's do it what what impact have you seen gut health increase in gut health have on people's connection to source or divinity or on their emotional state or their spiritual state have you noticed a change as people increase their gut health yeah i was slow to realize it um i was witnessing it uh, on a near daily basis in the clinic in those first few years but i just didn't uh, i didn't have the the vantage point uh to, to appreciate it for a few years and what was happening is that, you know, 12 months, 18 months into, to, you know, supporting the microbiome and, and the boundary. So when you take ion, the boundary of your gut lining becomes very strong. And so we've measured this with tight junction, you know, ele- electrical integrity and all these different, you know, modalities in science. But you rebuild this and then almost instantly you, you make a much stronger blood brain barrier and then kidney tubules are strengthened. So all these important boundary events that define who you are at the molecular level are strengthened through that communication network of the microbiome. And six months, you start to see patients really making radical change in their life. But suddenly 12 months, 18 months in, patients would come into my clinic, you know, in tears and give me a huge hug and say, doc, you're not going to believe what I did last month. And I thought maybe, you know, I don't know, you had first normal bowel movement in 20 years. You know, I was used to hearing those kinds of stories. Instead, they said, no, I left the marriage that had, uh, with my abusive husband for the last 30 years. Mm-hmm. And I realized I, I would deserve more than that. And I, I and I laid this down. And then, you know, a few days later, Doc, you won't believe what I did. I just quit my job and I'm starting the company that I've wanted to start for decades. And I just decided I, life is too short. I'm doing it. And I just thought these were feel good stories until finally started to realize, oh my God, how could it not be that way? When you put together your microscopic boundaries, mm-hmm. you have to put up better, stronger macro boundaries ultimately, because mm-hmm. energy is fractal. Whatever happens energetically at the atomic level happens at the cellular level. At the cellular level happens at the organ level. At the organ level happens at the human level. At the human level happens at the community level. The community level happens at the interface with the uh, multiple species at the multiple species you become planet earth and so you are you know connected and energetically you know uh, profoundly rooted in all of that and so how could it not be anything but a spiritual journey uh, when the microbiome puts your micro boundaries back up to allow you to see yourself for the same time and for the first time just as a friend or a spouse or a partner 
is the only one that can show you the mirror clearly enough of who you are and maybe your own beauty and maybe your own insecurities and everything else. The microbiome is doing that for you. Hundreds of thousands of species in your gut, skin, organ system, this whole ecology, this jungle and coral reef structure of beauty is in and around you saying, who are you? And who are you here to do? Uh, what is that purpose that's boiling up in you, giving you that sense of like drive, giving you that sense of like your skin, you're crawling out of your skin because you're not on purpose yet. So what is your purpose? And the microbiome, I think, is, is part of that. The bacteria, fungi can feel your purpose. They can feel your energy field. They want to be a part of that journey. They're encouraging that journey. They are supporting it with fuel and food and nutrients every day. They are nursemating you into the health that you need to do your purpose. And so I think it's a, absolutely a spiritual experience to take care of your, your gut, to take care of your microbiome. You have a, you have a wild nature within you, and, and it's ready to take care of you and inspire you to something great. Yeah, I know for me, my journey, somebody left a comment here, my journey, when I got healthy, it, it, I, I had to change my whole life. I had to go much like you. Like I changed my mind on everything I've ever believed. Everything's over. I'm starting from ground zero. Here I go. Now I'm on my path, but it wasn't until I got healthy. And it reminds me of something I heard you say on an interview recently. You said, I thought this was so profound. Just I'm like, it's like, <laughs> you have such a way of like, I knew that, but I didn't know that. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. You said, um, we don't, our food doesn't feed our cells. Our food feeds our microbiome and our microbiome food feeds our cells. And it's like, oh, because, you know, I will say, I, I feel like I have pretty good gut health and I feel like my absorption is pretty good. And it's that, I think being able to do that, you know, being able to take those nutrients and nourish all of my cells with it. It's like, once you've lived it, you know it, you feel it. That's why I think you become such an evangelist of health. Once you experience it at another level, because you're just like, guys, it can be so much better. It can be so much, you can be so much more aligned. And I have, I have found that to be true for myself, that being physically aligned with my body and honoring in nature. And I, you know, I go up in the mountains here in Utah and I rub dirt all over myself and I, I get all in the water. I want all of it. I'm barefoot. <laughs> like, I, you know, cause I want it. I'm like, please, the more aligned I can get with nature, the more of those, the, the oxygen and the, and the trees and by the waterfalls that I can breathe in truly truly i have had so many more downloads from divinity come into me it's just it's like now i'm connected here i am you know and here we live in this nice i've got this nice drywall behind me and this nice carpet underneath me and this nice you know glass and everything cutting me off from the world and when i you know when i'm in here it's okay it's you know shelter is great you know it's cool it's i'm down with shelter but we got to get out there more and connect. And I, you know, I go out at nighttime a lot and connect to the stars and the moon. You guys we're missing half the show. We're missing half the show. It is magic out there at night. And when we can get connected to that, then that's when I, for me, at least it's been like, that's when everything comes in and what I'm hearing, like what you're doing here, it, what's cool about this is you're not saying like, here's a medication that will replace things that you're missing that you now. it's like, no, 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 I'm, we're going to help boost your body's ability to do what it was already supposed to do before the glyphosate came in, before all the plastics came in for this, like, let's see what it would feel like if we were more connected to nature and our bodies were doing what they're always supposed to do. So thank you for facilitating a way, you know, I'm all about like, we're not going to go live in the wild. That's not going to happen. Like, no, we're, we like our shelter, you know, we like our modern conveniences too, but how can we m modify our modern lifestyles to fit nature, to bring more nature into our modern lifestyles? And I think that's what you've done here. And I'm getting an alert from Instagram that I only have one minute and 45 seconds left. So I think this is going to end. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much for being here and sharing yourself and for your mission and all you're doing. And I just want to say, guys, I messaged Dr. Zach's team and asked if I could get a coupon for this for you guys. So I put it in the comments right here. You can watch this on the replay. Um, and I'll post this again later on my Instagram um, and on my story. So you guys can get 15% off this wonderful, beautiful product for like two weeks just for you guys. So thank you for tuning in, Dr. Zach. It's such a pleasure to meet you. I hope to see you at an event sometime and hear more from you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you are doing. Uh, thank you to you. Thank you to the beautiful audience for your participation and your interest. You guys are all agents of change. Let's go build something beautiful. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Okay. Have a wonderful night. Bye. You bet. Take care.